Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Well, today on the bench, we have this Tandy Model 200 portable computer. And it has quite a unique problem. Whereas most of the time we have problems getting old computers to turn on, we can't get this guy to turn off. As soon as you apply power, it turns on and how, no matter how many times you press that power button, it won't shut off. And we know it's not the power button because the fellow that's owned this has already tried a new keyboard with the power button. I thought it was kind of a unique problem, so I said, go ahead and send that to me and we'll have a look. So, let's get started. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. They offer an excellent quick-term PCB prototyping service, which now has a free upgrade to the 150-160 temperature range. Ho, 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 it's that time of year. Check out PCBWay's 2022 PCBWay Christmas Big Sale. They've got lots of coupons and specials, so check it out and see what's in store for you. I've got some batteries in this guy, and I've got the battery uh, backup switch off. And as soon as I kick that guy on... We'll see, it comes on. Yeah, the screen on these aren't the best. And we can't turn it off. It'll eventually time out on its own and turn itself off. And as I mentioned, uh, the owner of this swapped in another keyboard from another machine he had. Uh, and that didn't work either. So it's not the button, although he thinks this button is bad. It is something in the machine. And as you notice, this is not clicking or latching in. It's a temporary button, so it has kind of a, a soft start type of thing. So before we start taking this thing apart, let's look at the schematic and the service manual and see what it tells us. So I've got this section of the technical manual that's all about the power supply and the automatic on and off circuit. If we go to the next to the last page of that section, it has a schematic of just this part. And we see the switch on the keyboard. And this looks like a slide switch, but it's really a push button. And what it's doing is feeding this transistor, which is feeding this NAND gate here, which is going to a flip-flop, which is going up to this flip-flop, which is going to this transistor, which is turning the DC to DC converter on. And since we know the DC to DC converter works, and we know the automatic power off works, and we know the problem wasn't the switch, it's going to be something in this area. The signal's not getting from the switch through all this mess to the DC to DC converter. So that is where we will need to look. One tricky part to the disassembly of this guy is getting this center cover off without breaking anything. And I always forget which way it snaps in there. There we go. Use the hook end of this to slip in there and pull that down. And see we have a connector here, a little flex cable that goes from the computer up to the screen that we have to disconnect to get those two parts separated. And I believe this just pulls down like that. And then we can take the screen loose. So I'll go ahead and get the cover off this thing. Uh, I've disassembled these on camera before. I'll put a link to my other Model 200 uh, videos below. And uh, then we'll have a look at the board. All right, first things first, let's make sure this power switch is indeed bad. I've got my probe here set on continuity beep. Okay, and I've got our schematic set out here, just like it is arranged on the switch. So we can look at the board here and see 2 and 5, which is the common. Those are shorted together. 
and four and six are the ones we're interested in. So this switch should either be shorting out four and five or uh, five and six. So if we measure across four and five, it's open. Measure across five and six, it's open. If we push the switch down, it's still open. If we push the switch down, it's still open. Again, it beeps if we have continuity. Uh, the owner said he tried to take the switch apart and it just crumbled. So um, it is indeed broken. Since this is a push button, uh, double pull, double throw, it's only used as a single pull, single throw though. Um, we're going to have to rig up something so we can test the rest of the circuit. So that'll be the ne next task. I found in my collection of miscellaneous switches, this old switch from Radio Shack, 275-1549. It is a push button, momentary, uh, single pull, double throw. So I have uh, the wires from the switch connected to the bad switch that's on the circuit board. I hot glued it down temporarily, put some Captan tape under here so it won't short against anything. Now on the normally open side, which is, uh, the black is common, green is normally open. And on the other side, that's normally closed, and now it's open. Okay, so now we can at least give the rest of the circuitry the correct signals through this flex cable here. And uh, try to turn it on and off while we're measuring the rest of the signals. So after opening the case, I was measuring pin 13 of M26 here. And the output was a little funny. Right now it's about 3.4 volts, but before it was about 2.5. And I thought, well, that's awfully low. Um, you see now we've got 3.5 volts because it's not on. It's running from the battery. And this... I also had the problem it wasn't turning on when power was applied like it originally was unless I turned the, the battery backup switch on and off. That made me suspicious of the memory battery here, so I measured it, and it was flat, of course. I let this thing charge up for several hours. And now, if we monitor the output of this chip and click our makeshift power switch here, we can see that switches and we are drawing 51 milliamps from the power supply now. Switch again. The state changes and we're drawing zero from the power supply now. So why does this happen? Why do we have any output from this chip um, when the power is off? Well, there are a few ICs on here that need to be powered up in order for this thing to power on and off and uh, reset properly. So more than the RAM is battery backed up. We've got M24, M25, and M26 all remain powered. Now these aren't switching or changing states during power off, so they're using very little power. Uh, I've seen several odd things uh, happen on the various you know Model 100, 102, 200 type computers when these memory batteries go low. Uh, some people will remove the battery. The problem there is sometimes they don't like powering up at all. You have a, a similar problem to this or it's hard to get them to reset properly because the, the whole state of it resetting, you know, powering on and resetting properly depends on these few chips here being powered all the time. So um, now we know we need to replace the battery. I noticed some bits of corrosion here on the board. Maybe I can zoom in on one. Yeah, just right here. There's a little down in this area. And I'm guessing since the battery tray is kind of setting here, there may have been some flakes of battery corrosion that got up in here. It's not real bad. That'll clean off fine. Um, and the owner of this one, the, the caps replaced too. And of course, I still need to find a power switch because this thing is obviously not going to work. So it turns out 
you know, a interesting symptom turned out to be a simple problem. The memory battery. So, um, I'm going to get all these repairs done. And when I find a switch, we'll solder that in and then we'll check it. So now I'll fit the new switch that the owner of this M200 sent and we'll give it a try. So we press the new switch and it turns on, but it won't turn off. So the symptoms are a little different. It's not turning itself on automatically anymore, but we still can't turn it off. When I first worked on this, I let the original battery charge up a bit and I rigged up a switch on the keyboard section here and it seemed to work. And it makes sense because the battery is involved in the reset circuitry, which is quite intricate. And uh, so I replaced the battery and put caps in it at the owner's request and the owner sent me a new switch put the new switch in and as we saw that didn't fix the problem so I went through the power control and reset circuit here checking all the signals and the one thing I want to point out is you know we have our switch here and it goes through this transistor deal to this gate and to this flip-flop and things and if you notice C70 right here, what C70 does is provide just a blip on its output whenever the input signal changes from low to high. It doesn't matter how long you hold the switch. We only get this very brief spike here at the output of C70. And this makes it a little hard to see what's going on or see if it's working. And to make matters worse, a lot of these parts are on the bottom of the board and you've got three boards you got to flip over and check. But we'll measure the input signal at pin 12 of M25 here, which is right here. And I'm going to point you up at the scope so you can see what's going on. Now I've got the probe on pin 12 of M25 and I've, I press the power button. We may or may not see a brief little glitch here on the screen. Nope, didn't see a thing. If I turn on a single trigger here i've got the cursor set to catch a negative going pulse from that high condition and we can see it right there and the grid size on this is two and a half microseconds so that is goes low for about oh you know, seven and a half microseconds and starts climbing so it is a really short spike that's all that's needed to trigger the gate and change the flip-flop but um you're not going to see that generally without a scope set in single shot mode. So anyhow, the, the power switch circuitry was working. Something else was wrong. So in probing around for the rest of the signals here, I was checking uh, this sort of flip-flop arrangement with NAND gates. And it's got another one of these coupling capacitors from the bell signal. So when it goes from low to high we're going to get a brief spike here and will cause some changes in this gate arrangement here now i had to track down the bell signal that actually comes from the microprocessor yep the bell signal comes from the microprocessor it is an output from port b it's what causes that brief uh, blip or you know like sound when you turn the computer on it's triggering the, the buzzer a little bit, and it's also part of the reset circuitry. Who knew? So, uh, when measuring that signal at pin 34, let's look at the scope again. Pin 34, that was an off condition. I rigged it so it would do that. And on again, you can see we get a nice zero to five volt swing there. If I measure at the input of C71, now look at that. That doesn't look right, does it? Just have the probe on there is, is causing something to, to drain down. I noticed if I pressed on C71, it would do something like that. Um, so the reason it was sort of working when I was probing that uh, with the oscilloscope probe, I thought maybe I was flexing the board and 
I was causing something to make contact. No, that was not it. Um, let's look at the board again. So the signal from the processor comes up through this via. We're about five volts here. It's about zero volts there. It's about five volts there, nice signal. That runs right up to the cap here, zero volts. Nothing, 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 nothing. So we're losing the signal in this trace between this via and that capacitor. So uh, I'll get power shut off and we'll verify that with an ohm meter and then see if we can figure out where that little trace is broken. So we test that with the ohm meter and yep, that trace is definitely open. Here's a close up of that area with the solder mask scraped off a little bit. You can see that trace is broken right at the via. So now we'll go ahead and patch that broken trace. Okay, we've got our little bodge soldered in here. I took a strand of thin wire, poked it down in the via to the other side and scraped some of the trace off there so I could solder those together. On the bottom of the board right up here is a resistor so I couldn't use a, a trace repair kit, ferrule, that type of thing. So I went with the good old proven to work bodge wire. I've been testing this uh, without the LCD connected because I'm powering it with my bench power supply and I can watch the current draw change. So what I'm going to do in this next clip is point you at the power supply while I'm pressing the power button and we'll watch the current draw change and see if we have fixed this board. Okay, now the machine is powered off. I'm going to press the power button and it's on. Draws about 51 milliamps without the screen connected. That's about right. Press the button again and it's off. Very good. Press the button and it's on. Press the button and it's off. It is actually drawing a few microamps uh, in the off mode, but that's below the resolution of our meter here, so we don't see it. Uh, you know, this is also charging the, the memory battery, but it, it, the charge current so low, we're not going to see it. Well, how about that? We got our Model 200 here turning on and off with the push of a button. It was kind of an interesting set of symptoms. Uh, when we let the original memory backup battery charge up a little bit, it seemed to start working right. And as soon as I installed a new set of caps and a new battery and a working power switch, it stopped working right again. It seemed like there might have been a little problem there with a broken trace with board flexing. And it was a problem with a broken trace, but the, what I thought was causing it to work from board flexing was just putting a little bit of load on that part of the circuit. I even found out I could lick my finger and pop on capacitor 71 and it would sort of work. It was kind of weird. And that's what led me to looking for the source of that bell signal and finding out that that trace was broken. So it wasn't real difficult. Um, I actually got interrupted for a few days working on this this week and it was probably a good thing because it allowed me to, to think a little more about it before I, I dove in and started pulling chips up and things like that. Anyhow, this is going to go back to its owners today. He's excited to get it. And then we'll get to working on something else. If you have any questions or comments, well, just leave them in that comment section down below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who helps support the Haybert channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated. Have a Merry Christmas and until next time, bye.